Hello. Uh, if you hadn't been living under the rocks for past few years, uh, you probably noticed that the age of AI is upon us. It's almost everywhere. I mean, we have driverless cars, driverless taxis, trains are running themselves, oftentimes uh, better than <coughs> normal drivers. Uh, we also have tools that are able to produce art or at least pretty pictures and also these Lovecraftian horrors on the, on the other side. We also have language models and chatbots that are able to pass the Turing test, that are able to converse with people, that are able to, uh, to create essays, uh, to summarize text and all the other fancy stuff. And uh, it's natural to ask, uh, what is the state of the AI in cybersecurity? I mean, where we are on this scale of two homicidal uh, artificial maniacs? And this largely depends on who you are asking. If you ask the companies that are selling uh, AI-powered uh, systems for cybersecurity, yeah, they will tell you they're swiftly approaching the shutdown level uh, of capabilities. If you ask anybody else, mostly the researchers in this area, you'll probably get the answer that uh, even the Roomba is overselling our current, current capabilities. And uh, what's the reason for that? I mean, uh, just a few numbers uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, the Tesla, that uh, their new uh, beta uh, driverless uh, mode has driven more than 250 million kilometers. And every time, some, every time something happens, it just it uploaded to the servers and it used to uh, refine their models. Stable Diffusion is producing those uh, pretty pictures. Yeah, they used 160 million images to train, uh, train their model. GPT-3, the obsolete one uh, right now, has used 45 terabytes of text data to train and produce the model. What do we have in security? Well, mostly limited data sets. It was uh, not so long ago, time that for about 10 years, the old, for training uh, machine learning powered systems, we were all using the same old obsolete data sets. And the situation really hasn't changed that much because there's not enough data sets and they're not, let's say, variable enough. They do not cover all the use cases that we want to focus on and they don't really reflect the real world situation. And also, we don't really have the environments where to train those autonomous cybersecurity agents. Uh, so uh, the situation is, uh, in a way, quite bad. But uh, as I assume, most of you here are uh, developers. So what is the natural reaction? Is a, do something about it. Create some environment where you can train those uh, train those agents where you can work on that uh, work on that cybersecurity. Uh, but there's a good reason why the state of these tools and of uh, uh, let's say cybersecurity autonomy is where it is, and it's because it's not a really uh, easy problem. So for start starters, if you want to create an environment where uh, where you want to train something. You first have to decide, uh, let's say, which paradigm to use. Will you just simulate everything? Will you be using, say, Docker containers? Uh, will you use fully virtualized networks and so on, or some hybrid approach? And uh, going back uh, to those large numbers a few slides ago, uh, just imagine that you want to do hundreds and thousands and millions of uh, different scenarios that you want to play out. And you suddenly realize that you really can't work with virtualized environments because you don't have the hardware and power to run so many 
different scenarios to all restore all these uh, different uh, scenarios and uh, prepare the hardware. Also, you usually don't have uh, all those vulnerable machines that you want to try and so on. So it's, uh, uh, it's a problem to get all the stuff that you need. And in, even in emulation, you just hit the same brick wall. You just can't uh, run it all. So the only way to say prepare the environment for training uh, uh, autonomous cybersecurity tools is to have a, some kind of simulation environment. So does any one of you recognize some of these pictures? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Uh, the reason I'm showing is that these are uh, OpenAI gym environments that are used for training uh, machine learning algorithms. The problem is that uh, you can't really use them for cybersecurity. I mean, this, this is not how you secure your network. And uh, this is the problem that uh, all those environments that are available are just simple abstract problems that just, they don't reflect uh, what the cybersecurity is about. How everything is uh, connected, intertwined, the domain is really large. And this is a really, uh, really hard stuff to uh, come up with the uh, environment that uh, is able to reflect that, uh, that complexity. And, but let's say you, uh, you somehow get your hands on uh, that type of environment, that you have an environment where you can train it, whether uh, where the environment reflects uh, the complexity of the domain and that you can simulate everything you need. Let's just, for the sake of the argument, say that you have this. Is it all that you need for uh, training autonomous agents or having work, uh, working autonomous cybersecurity agents? And the answer is not really. I mean, this, this is just a high level description of all the problems that probably needs to be solved before we can even think about letting autonomous cybersecurity agents loose. And uh, some of these stuff may not uh, be applicable to, let's say, normal domain that this was done for, uh, for the army, but uh, most of it is, uh, uh, is valid even for uh, civilian context. So, uh, but one step at a time. And uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, I want to just guide you or present you the decisions that one has to make uh, when deciding uh, what to do when you want to create a simulation environment and that, uh, that you want to use for training autonomous cybersecurity agents that will be usable. So not something that's, uh, let's say, just doing some abstract stuff, that's, but something that can later be deployed and used in the real world context. So it starts with, let's say, one easier decision that it's to, uh, to choose what modeling approach will use, whether it be some kind of district, discrete event simulation, markup processes, the inventory. This is actually one of the few questions that uh, is not really that important because uh, you can probably uh, get away with, uh, with anything. The harder part is uh, choosing the, the abstraction that you, uh, that you want to use. And so for example, I'll start with, uh, with network modeling. Like, uh, let's say that you want to create an autonomous agent that will be able to somehow guard or attack, this doesn't really matter, uh, some, uh, some kind of network. Then you probably have to, uh, in that environment, have some representation of that network. So yeah, it's just network, what it is, it's a collection of nodes that are, yeah, that are connected, uh, some connections, but uh, is this enough to decide what to do? You probably need to uh, do some refinements. You have to say, that, okay, so there are two types of nodes, like we have a, something on the edge and then we have network, uh, net active network devices. 
But on the edge there are different types of machines like yeah, you have workstations, you have servers, you somehow need to uh, account, that for, uh, account for that in the model. And how about the, let's say, IoT stuff? You have the cameras that are linked, you have uh, some kind of printers, These printers are good vectors for attacks. But how about IoT devices, laptops, mobile phones, whatnot? And all the stuff in the cloud, will you account for that in the model? You have to, because it's just what it is right now. So when you want to model how the infrastructure looks on, let's say, the network level, you have to account for the current realities. And that's, uh, it's a bit complicated. And it needs to be uh, detailed enough for that autonomous agent to decide, and to decide correctly. But let's say, okay, you decide on some, uh, some kind of uh, infrastructure. But for you, now it's the, another part. How do you model those nodes that are, uh, that are in the infrastructure? Well, the type of the node, like the PC, uh, phone, a printer, or whatever, will be enough? Or will you have to include more? Like, what, are, what is the operating system running on it? What are the services running on it? And uh, if you think about how different exploit looks like and how the tools that are using them to exploit this stuff, how they work, you will probably need to get it, uh, give it something more to work with. So for some exploits, yeah, you will need to have at least some kind of model of, uh, of the file system. You may need some model of memory. And for even some lower, lower level of uh, exploits, you may need uh, modeling the communication between buses. It's just, it's your decision, and it's, uh, you always have to uh, think about what the agent will do, what it will, will, what it will be capable to do. How about connections between those, uh, between those nodes? I mean, you can decide on a medium whether, whether you will be simulating that there's a difference between, uh, for example, going over the air, over the wire. Will you be modeling the properties, like the bandwidth of the connections? It's needed if you want, to, uh, if you want uh, your agent to, for example, be able to work with uh, DOS attacks. Because then you need to model that, uh, how the connection looks like. And how about protocols? There are many different attacks on, uh, on protocols that are abusing uh, their structure or whatnot, so you probably need to include that or not. It really depends uh, uh, what you expect your agent to do. And how about the users? It's another kind of worm. I mean, do you even want to have users in your simulations? Or do you just say, okay, Let's say there are no users and we're just securing the infrastructure or attacking. And, but if you decide that you won't have users, uh, will there be just some kind of user types or will they have different identities that are, for example, linked to different data on those nodes? Are the users active? Are they doing something or are they just reacting to, let's say, uh, external stimuli? Do they produce some traffic? Even uh, are they just working eight hours a day? Do you want to s just model uh, their behavior as the day goes on? There's a, really hundreds of considerations that you have to do. And each of these considerations will affect what the agent will be able to do. And we're talking both attackers and defenders. Because uh, if, if you don't model something, then the agent is not able to react on it or act on it. So yeah, hundreds of considerations and what I describe right now is still just only the passive side. You're describing what is the environment where it happens. But when you're trying to create a simulation that's workable, you also need to think about the active side. You need to, think, need, need to think about 
what uh, the agents can do. So, for example, and I'm talking right now about attackers. How do you model that the attacker, uh, the attacks unfold? I mean, uh, for quite a long time, this was the default attack model that was considered in uh, research publications. There is a attacker and there's a target. That's all. Something happens in between. Okay, then there was, let's say, uh, US attacks or uh, some attacks that require co uh, coordination. Okay, more attackers, one target. Still, nothing complicated. But then you have things like this. That's uh, just a representation of what Stuxnet did. And you see that the attack path, and usually attack path of any uh, APT or some uh, more complex malware is much more complicated. So when you're considering how to model the attack, you just need it to enable it to do all this stuff. If you want it to be able to act upon it and uh, act reasonably. Which adds another layer of complexity because uh, when you give the actions to the agent that can do, uh, they need to be expressible within that model. They need to have the impact and the agent must be able to learn that impact. Again, there's something you need to incorporate in that model because then when you're implementing it, you need to be able to to provide the correct outputs for agents' input. So what will you do? Will you just some kind of, <coughs> sorry, some kind of abstract actions? Which is, uh, <coughs> for example, this is something that is currently mostly being done. That there are only few abstract actions, like say, okay, I'm scanning, or I'm, I don't know, I'm brute forcing, I'm exfiltrating keys, and that's all. But if you ever use uh, those tools that are doing those attacks, the uh, actions are usually much more complex. You have to set a lot of parameters for <coughs> those actions to work. You can also use uh, some kind of attack and defense taxonomies that are available, or you can use something, uh, something of your own. This is just for illustration. These are attack and defense uh, frameworks that done by Mitra that uh, provide uh, some kind of uh, structure to possible attack and defense actions. There, uh, say, this is just a high level. There, there are also many different uh, tactics uh, that are uh, linked to uh, each of the, uh, those categories. But uh, yeah, if you want to simulate that, and if you decide you want to simulate it, then you just need to go through each of these actions, probably possibly each of those uh, uh, the techniques, and you need to implement how uh, those techniques reflect in your model. So there's quite a lot of stuff that probably needs to be done, and you get this for free when you're having fully virtualized environment. But as I said earlier, you really can't do that because you don't have the hardware. So yeah, you're kind of stuck uh, between the rock and a hard place with this. And uh, I would just uh, briefly introduce uh, one, uh, one of the simulation environments, uh, one that uh, I've developed or started, uh, started the development of uh, currently a work of uh, many people. And uh, yeah, I, I never wanted to do this. I just wanted to produce, produce the agents. But instead, I spent a couple of years doing this, and it's been only recently that I uh, got into the uh, state that I can use it to train something, uh, something usable. So uh, that's the simulation environment. It's just one combination of all the possible uh, parameters, all the possible decisions that I've uh, described earlier. And it's a discrete event simulator that uh, supports message passing. Uh, it provides is mostly used for uh, simulation of lateral movement, which means that there is the infrastructure somehow simulated, and uh, there are services uh, simulated as running on those nodes, uh, and uh, 
there's not that many complexity. There's a, uh, but it provides uh, 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 provides the really comprehensive authentication authorization framework. It's working with uh, uh, with uh, vulnerabilities that have those on CVE sets tied to uh, Metasploit and so on. So it's being done in a way that the agents uh, trained on that simulation can be then uh, moved to, uh, to the real world. And uh, yeah, it, it integrates with uh, those different uh, machine learning uh, toolkits. Uh, it enables uh, to use different uh, behavioral models so that you can plug different behaviors of, or different actions that the agents can do and then you can, uh, let's say, compare how, uh, how these works. And uh, it even simulates uh, or enables uh, integration with stuff running outside the simulation so that you don't need to re-implement everything in the simulation. So you can have your ideas or RPS running outside of it and there's just a, a bridge between, uh, between those two that you can just take the messages that are running in the simulation, convert it to something that uh, the IDS IPS uh, understands, just let it process it and give you back the response. So it's just trying to reduce the uh, effort that the uh, user of the system uh, needs to do. Why I'm saying it is because it's just it's, it's open source. You can uh, you can try, you can download it, you can you can play with it. Uh, Easiest way to find it is just to uh, look at uh, PyPay and uh, yeah, there's uh, also a documentation. It's it's a research project, so the documentation is incomplete as it usually is, but you can start doing something with that. Um, we have a lot to uh, lot in, uh, we have a uh, big plans with this, and the development still continues. A uh, few things, just to, uh, to name that uh, we're working on is uh, one uh, that's tied to the unavailability of, uh, of data sets and that is uh, we're building a mechanism that can create a realistic uh, simulation, a realistic, er, sorry, realistic scenarios so that you just uh, provide it with uh, some constraints what you want to have in this uh, scenario. For example, yeah, I want to have uh, this large infrastructure with some of those uh, services or uh, nodes running and it will construct uh, uh, a vulnerable infrastructure that uh, has uh, some attack paths that uh, runs through it and then uh, is able to instantiate it. And uh, the other important thing is that we are uh, working on transition from the simulation to, uh, to emulation. So that mean when, and this, this is one big problem in this area that uh, when you have the agent that trains on the simulation, you then need to somehow move it outside. And this, this transition is, uh, is complicated because in a simulation you're working with abstract actions. You try to move it to real world and somehow this doesn't uh, really transfer. You, in the real world, you have to use different tools. You have to give the agent the ability to affect the environment. So that's something that we, uh, we're working on and we have uh, some working prototypes that the agent can just directly use uh, what has been training with or training on and it just moved to real world. It still, it still thinks uh, that it's uh, inside a simulation environment, nothing changes for it, uh, but uh, it's doing uh, a real world uh, work on the outside. If this is, this, this may be too long for you, and uh, I, I understand it because it's uh, really uh, at the beginnings. And you can, for example, want it to be, say, available as a service that uh, it can already create some scenarios that you uh, enables you to play with those uh, those agents that perhaps visual and other things or whatever. And maybe just only the big green button that does all the stuff. We're working on that too. It's a, uh, just a sneak peek uh, preview of uh, what we're working on and it's the uh, AI Dojo project that we're doing as a collaboration between Maastricht University and uh, Cheveb Dev. And this is something uh, that uh, will be 
oh, th this should be an integrated environment for development of uh, those other type of technologies with already uh, pre-made agents that you can use something that, for example, if you want to train users with those agents that they can collaborate with or they can fight against each other and uh, provide you with uh, all the analytics and all the control of that. But that's going to take, uh, it's going to take some time. So this is the current state. You know, uh, I'll wait a few years, then we'll have something, and maybe <laughs> uh, my presentation uh, will be different at the time. Or you can just try to code something and see uh, where it gets you. And that's all for me for today. Thank you. Questions? You want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> um, what analytical models did you implement or did you implement a single one? Do you see advantage in implementing multiple ones to get better results on the analytical side of the model? We actually implemented multiple models. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we learned uh, was that uh, those, and I'm thinking about uh, talking about uh, some kind of research uh, research model that was some kind of taxonomy of uh, attack actions, and uh, it turned out that on the paper it sounded good, mm -hmm. and when we tried to implement it, we just uh, find a lot of edge cases where it was not working, it was not complete, it was overlapping. So, uh, yeah, we're still trying to find a good model that's comprehensive enough, but it's implementable <laughs> in the simulation and it translates well to, uh, to the real world. So, that's, yeah, that's the situation. So, um, Microsoft has a Cyber security, yeah. you know, what, co or help thing. Uh, how does this relate to that? Is there there are uh, people that are trying to use those uh, language models to drive uh, those agents. And uh, it kind of sort of works. And usually those language models, they are, they are noisy. They're producing outputs that sometimes works, sometimes does not. So if we use it, for example, to drive a penetration testing tool, uh, it works in a way. Because there's, there's no problem with it. Uh, because even if you do wrong actions, nothing bad really happens. But uh, <coughs> in this situation, you don't want to use it as a uh, drivers of the defense, because you you can't really uh, work with let's say 80% success rate. So yeah, people are using it. It produces some results, but uh, I think uh, going the last last mile to have it. To, to use it as something that you can trust, that's going to take much longer time. But it's, it's a possible approach. What are the measures being applied as solutions to prevent the uh, defense agents from being compromised? Hmm. That's a good action. I'm, I'm <laughs> this question. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's. Uh, this really depends on the use of the agents that prepare it somehow. This uh, let's say beyond my uh, my domain. I was actually wondering about that myself, and at the risk of exposing a lot of ignorance here, <laughs> what I was worried about was like um, after you have this, you know, the simulation things trains. When you're trying to protect something in the real world, does it have to know what it's protecting? In other words, understanding the configurations of all the machines and the open ports and you, you just everything else and it seems to me the simplest way to gather that information is to have like a privileged crawler or something like that like that can draw information from the different machines and find out about their configurations but if it's doing that it's on your network and if that thing gets compromised <coughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah that, that, that's a hard problem and uh, usually uh, what this what hap what's happening in a simulation world is that uh, those agents are provided that uh, global overview of state, something that you, you've described, and that's what they are being trained on. I mean, I'm not aware of somebody doing the defender that would take care of the whole infrastructure and does not have 
access to this. So, yeah, first time it gets compromised, it's going to get ugly. Mm -hmm. But then, on the other hand, I'm uh, working mostly on attackers, so I'm okay with that. How many people are in well, your team or the whole project that's working on this? Uh, that AI do job, it's probably 10 people, something like that. I was thinking uh, if you had reached out to some, because uh, I saw the um, disclaimer that they are funded by some European uh, project. Uh, but have you tried securing some uh, funding or support from some of the big companies that are certainly interested in <laughs> <laughs> uh, this type of work? Actually, not not a big companies. Uh, this uh, uh, this research started uh, originally as a research working group by uh, NATO and uh, we got some support for uh, developing prototypes of uh, those type of agents. But uh, no, we're, we're actually not, uh, not contacting uh, large companies because fortunately we still have funding from public sources and uh, usually we want to, uh, let's say, have everything as open as possible and we're not sure how it will turn out. Companies. What is the end game for this? Uh, are, we, are you expecting to have some AI, let's say, uh, defender or attacker or <coughs> say, some actor who will change setups in, in our networks in the end to keep it secure? Well, that's something I would like. I would like to have those age, uh, those attackers and defenders. Uh, so fighting against each other and uh, bettering themselves. Uh, and one, one of the reasons is that uh, what I see in the literature often is that the attackers are usually pretty stupid. That's, they're not doing uh, much of the complicated work. It's and not sophisticated. Yeah. Like that, yeah. And that's, uh, then there's a, there's a perception that the attackers are like this and the defenses are being tailored against those type of attackers. So I would like to have <laughs> even better attackers so that the def defenders can get really better and to have it, uh, let's say, on... Yeah, to move it to a higher level. Okay, thanks. Have you considered integration with Cyber Range? They have on BOT. Yeah, we also have one, <laughs> and uh, it is, this is not another step. Uh, we uh, right now we have the simulation. We have a way to transfer it to emulation. Like uh, we have a, some kind of configuration that describes how the infrastructure with all the agents looks uh, in a simulated environment. We have a way to transform it to uh, a dockerized environment. And, uh, but uh, all those configurations are pretty easily transferable, so we'll be moving it, those best agents or the, those agents that need to, for example, uh, uh, interact with, uh, with humans, we'll be moving it also to, uh, to that virtualized environment. Yeah, um, I guess these are the questions we had. Uh, before we all disperse, uh, I've been asked to inform everybody that, number one, uh, there is going to be a social event today, so you can pick up your tickets and uh, check in uh, during the lunch period. Uh, second, uh, there is going to be a way to give feedback on sketch.org, so if you want, you can say how you liked or didn't like the event. Third. After we have the social event uh, around 21.30, I think, there is going to be some fireworks and drone show uh, around the den. So if you want to watch, you can uh, you know, join in. It's public, it's not funded or in any way endorsed by this um, organization, but it's a nice event anyway. And finally, uh, there's going to be a win-win-win session tomorrow where you can win some swag or answering, yeah. You can see that.
but that's, that was just on the screen. So yeah, you can win some swag for answering questions. So yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Okay.